Let's pray and we'll get started. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the opportunity we have to be here. We're grateful, Father, for the for the avenue of study that we have, and we can come to class and and we can open your word and know that we can uh, that we can study it with confidence. Thank you, Father, for that. Bless those that, that we've talked about. Be with Daniel. Uh, thank you for for Justin Haley's son who was just baptized. Uh, we pray, Father, for Sarah who is uh, who is at home today struggling with her health as well. I think some uh, her knee or something is giving her a real problem. And we just pray for her, Father, that uh, that she'll get better soon. Father, bless us. Help us as we study. And Father, please help us as we worship this morning that you'll find soft and tender hearts uh, to offer that offer praise to you. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Remember, I told you this is a this this is a chapter 14, 15, 16, and into 17. 17 is going to be more of a prayer, but it's a discourse where Jesus is talking to his apostles, his disciples, and he is and he is letting them know this is the night of his betrayal. He's already Judas is already gone and to, to do what he's going to do. He hasn't gone to the garden yet. This is this is only recorded in the book of John. The only place you have you have bits and pieces recorded, but it's the only place where for three chapters he records him telling them all this stuff, all these things. And basically, I'm gone. I'm leaving. You, today is it. Uh, and and he's letting them know how how great a deal that is and how wonderful it is. And he tells them, I know that you're concerned. I know that you're afraid. But I'm going to send you a helper. I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit, who is going to be a who is going to be a, a an advocate for you, it's going to be a comforter for you. And so I'm going to, and that's what he started talking about in chapter 16. And we looked last week at what the Holy Spirit's work was going to be. The Holy Spirit was going to testify about Jesus. And it's going to be to let the world know that Jesus is real, because everything that we do, everything that we are, everything that the world does, whether they know it or not, hinges on whether Jesus was real or not and how we respond to Him. What do we do with what, what we know to be true? What we do is we're going to be obedient. We're going to believe in Him and be obedient to Him. That's what we're going to do. But that's not what the world does. And it's going to be our job, okay, you, with the Holy Spirit's help, to testify on His behalf as well. That's our job. Well, He says that the Holy Spirit, last week we looked at the first part of 16, where it says that, he, that, the, that the Holy Spirit's job is going to be to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And we looked at that. That he's going to bring a he's going to bring a judicial a charge against the world about sin and righteousness and judgment, and and then and then he talks about that he will that uh, that this uh, uh, where was it at I wanted to tell you something uh, he said that that the prince of this world is going to be is going to be not gone but be bound up basically. And what he, what he said at the end of this is because the prince of this world now stands condemned. Okay? Doesn't mean he's gone. Doesn't mean he's not active. But he's condemned already. We looked at the cross is what's going to condemn him. Okay? If you remember, we looked at, at we didn't look at it, but I, I referred back to Genesis chapter 3, which is called the mother promise. And in verse 15, it says that, that Jesus, I mean, God is confronting Adam and Eve and the serpent. And he tells the serpent, he said, one of these days. He said, "The seed of woman is gonna. You're gonna. You're gonna strike him on his heel, but he's gonna crush your head." And Jesus, it become is that seed of the woman. And we know that from other scriptures. He said, "He's the seed of the woman, and he is gonna crush the power of Satan." Satan has no power once death is conquered, and that's what he's gonna do. And his death, and his burial, and his resurrection. That's why it's such good news. That's why it's so powerful, and it's good news to us and to a lost and dying world. You know, the world is looking and and desperately in need of. A, 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 a an answer to the problems they have okay doesn't mean they'll listen to you but they're desperately in need and we know that when we come in in contact with them most of the time all the time it's because many of them don't have a relationship with God they don't have a relationship with Jesus they don't have they can't move forward because they're just stuck in the mud spinning their wheels in the same old place they've always been and can't never get out because they never will get give themselves over to Christ and let Christ change their life. That's what the Holy Spirit is going to guide them in. And then we're going to pick it up in chapter 16 and verse 12 is where we're going to be. I want you to look at a couple of things that he says here. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. Now, let's stop right there. Jesus has already told us this about himself. If you go back to John chapter 12, about verse 46, 47, 48, somewhere in there, 
He said, I didn't speak on my own accord. He said, I didn't, I didn't speak on my own. He said, I only spoke what the Father told me to say. I related to you what the Father told me. So as the Father sends the Spirit, and Jesus sends the Spirit back, He said, the Spirit won't come unless I go. I have to go for Him to come. He said, I will send Him. And look at what He said. He said, He's going to guide you into all the truth. He's going to bring into your remembrance everything that I've talked to you about. And that's going to be significant because of what's, we're going, to, what's going to happen next in this chapter, what He's going to tell them next. Okay? Because everything's going to change. Everything changes now. There's not going to, it's not going to be the same now. Once Jesus, in a, in this, and this is about hours, days. What are you talking about? We're talking about hours. Because in a few short hours, he's going to be handcuffed, beat up, spit on, mocked, and then started, they're going to start the scourging process and start the process of putting him, hanging him, nailing him to the cross in a few short hours here. And he knows that. Okay? He knows. So when he says here, he said, he will guide you in the order of truth. <laughs> it means he will guide them to the truth and they will follow him. They, because he is going to he is going to answer for them the questions that they have that that the father is going to start answering for him in just a moment look at when look at what the next thing he said he will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you now whoa what what did he say he said he will glorify me that means he will elevate me he will honor me he will elevate me in this lost world because what I'm what he's going to have is what I'm going to give to him does it sound like the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are in, are in, they're working together, doesn't it? So I can trust what's being told to me. I can trust what the Spirit's doing in my life. I can trust the indwelling of the Spirit because that's what I'm told. You know, we're gonna and and you know when he when he says this, he said, "All that belongs to the Father is mine." This is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what He will make known to you. And I and I and I wrote down here, how is He going to do that? How is He going to guide them? How is He going to testify? He's going to testify in a big way. Through these guys, through these 12 guys, because remember, you know, well, they have, it didn't have left 12 yet, it's 11 now. They're going to pick Matthias in a, in a while, but that's going to be in a few days before they're going to pick him, because Judas is gone, so there's 11 of them. And I told you, in this text, he's talking to his disciples, he's not talking to everybody standing there, he's talking to his disciples. He's talking to the apostles, the ones he's chosen, that's who he's talking to. And he said, he said, this is what's going to happen, he's going to guide you in all the truth, I'm going to make known to you the truth. And he said, and he said, and he will glorify me. He's going to elevate me. How's he going to do that with these eleven guys? You think? How's that going to happen? How will he glorify? The, how will he glorify Jesus through these eleven guys? What's going to happen? I'm going to speak. Okay. We're going to give them words to say. All right. We're going to give them powers to perform. Right. To miracles that are going to happen through them. It's all going to testify because all of them, you know, they're not going to testify about the Spirit. They're going to testify about Jesus. They're going to honor Jesus through what the Holy Spirit's going to allow them to do. Now, another big way is what's going to happen with uh, for us. How's it going to affect us? Huh? It's going to show us the truth. Is that what you said? But what? How's it going to? How's it? How's that happen? Tell me how. How's he going to glorify Jesus for us? But how's the Holy Spirit going to do that? How is he going to do that? It's, he's going to come and, and, and he's going to come on these guys in, on the day of Pentecost with power. All right, if you, if you're in my X class. That's what I mean. We studied that with power. Okay, he's going to. He, Jesus already said he's no longer going to be with you. He's going to be in you. And Acts chapter two said that we receive that gift the same, not the same way, but we receive the indwelling. Ephesians chapter one tells us that we have him as a down payment, guaranteeing what's to come. I have the down payment of the Holy Spirit. The, uh, I think Second Corinthians talks about that he is that he is a gift that we receive. I have received the, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So, how, but how with these guys is he going to testify to me back then? I get to read what they wrote. Okay, they wrote it. They wrote it through the through the in, through the inspiration of God, through the Holy Spirit guiding them into what to say. The prophets, you know that. That when God was speaking to them, you know, they they didn't even understand what they were writing. But we have this written down, you know, that we can we can look at it and say, man, I can look at first, second, third John, look at John, look at look at all the things he wrote. I can look at what Paul wrote. I can look at what Peter wrote. I can look at what these guys wrote. Matthew, Mark. I can look at these things and I can say, okay, you know, how is this every bit of it testifies about Jesus and elevates him so that I can have a better understanding of what I'm gonna need in my life. Now, let's move on. Okay? 
<clears throat> this is where, you know, we're going to read for a bit here, okay? Uh-huh. Oh, we can't get off subject. We never do that in here. <laughs> you know, I Go ahead. understand the Old Testament, you know, the prophets and stuff, they recorded, the Jews recorded more history in the Old Testament. But the New Testament is the, you know, the gospel and spoken of Jesus, which the Jews didn't believe in. Mm -hmm. didn't re how, was it, how was it saved and recorded, these books recorded, for us to have today whenever the Jews weren't really uh, interested in keeping it? Or, or, I mean, the ones that become Christians were, but I've kind of missed the history of how... Well, if you remember, they had a lot of these, right? They had a much of it. Jesus gets up in the synagogue and talks to them out of the book of Isaiah. Okay? They have the first five books that Moses wrote. They have that. They have much of Psalms that David wrote. They have all of this stuff. Okay? They have a, a compilation of it. Now, did that carry on for us? You know, I don't know exactly. You'd have to ask Cole. He's way more versed at this than I am of what it of, of how that all transpired. But if you talk to him, it's, it's pretty fascinating, you know, how it all transpired. But but these guys had that. I mean, they were they were preached when Jesus quoted them out of the book of Amos. You know, when they quoted out of out of the book of Hosea, uh, they quoted those scriptures. They quoted them in the New Testament. They were quoted. A lot of the the, the gospel writers, uh, Paul and Peter, John, they quote out of these out of these texts. Okay, so they did have them. Now it wasn't whether they had it or not; is whether they were going to believe it or not. And they chose not to believe it. Who recorded and saved the letters of the apostles to the churches and stuff? The New Testament. Who, who recorded and? I mean, I know they had the letters, but how did those get preserved? Since I, the church I can't tell you, Keith. I, 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 I don't. I don't know exactly. They made copies and distributed it to all churches. Yeah, there, there was a lot of copies, uh, you know, that were that were spread around. I don't know exactly how all of that happened. I'm, you know, I know. I believe, me personally, I believe that God did. I believe that God took care of it so that we would have a written record and so that we would have, I believe, I mean, there's a, if you go and look, and you watch the Discovery Channel, they'll tell you all, all there is to know about all this stuff. Okay. Well, yeah. that's, that's, you know, that's funny, right? That's, that was a joke. But I've seen so much stuff on some of the TV shows that I know is absolute garbage. Okay? But I'm looking at this, I'm going, and, and you know, and somebody may be watching and saying, I'm watching a TV show right now, and this is absolute garbage. You know you know, it's, I guess it's forever. And it was the, less than 200 years before the Catholic Church, the beginnings of it began, and so they also made sure that... So and they preserved a lot of it. Catholicism preserved a lot of it, and, and you know, they... Uh, and and that was instrumental. Uh, but I don't know exactly. What I have to rely on, because I'm not smart enough, is I have to I believe that God preserved it. I believe He used whatever means was necessary and preserved it so that I would have what I needed to go to heaven. It tells me that everything I need that pertains to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him. Well, how do I have the knowledge of Him if He hadn't preserved the text from me? How, how, how do I have that? It also says that He said, I'll write these things to you that you might know that you have eternal life. Well, that's from John. John wrote that in John in Second in, in First John. He writes that and says, how can He write that? And if I if if two thousand years, three thousand years, whatever it is later that I don't have it written down where I can look at it and say, oh, okay, now I got it, and I can connect the dots. I've spent, most of you know, I've spent most of my adult life trying to connect the dots and prove this thing wrong. That's where I was for a long time, trying to prove that it wasn't what it said it was. So I learned how to connect a lot of dots, and the more I connected them, the more true it became to me, and the more valid it became. So, you know, i got to go on faith. I'm going to go on faith, all right? Now, let's move on. Okay. Jesus went on to say, in a little while, you will see me no more, and then after a little while, you will see me. At this, some of the disciples said to one another, what does he mean by saying, in a little while, you will see me no more, and then for a little while, you will see me, and because I am going to the Father. They kept asking, what does he mean, a little while? We don't understand what he's saying. You know, they still don't get it that in a few short moments, their friend that they've been with for three years that has guided them and, and they've left their families for, is going to be gone. They still don't get it. See, keep this is... See, these guys have the scriptures. They don't get it either. They, they, they know that there's scriptures out there. They watch Jesus and listen to him, and they still don't understand. They don't understand what about the cross. You know, think about it. How, how hard would that be to really wrap your mind around? That, that this guy that we believe can, can move mountains, can do anything, is going to die and allow himself to be killed. That's what they don't get. And then Jesus said, Jesus said they, they wanted to ask him about this. So he said to them, are you asking one another what I meant? When I said in a little while you will see me no more, and then for a little while you will see me? 
Very truly, I tell you. Now, now, here is what he's going to say now is directed at these 11 guys, okay? And they, are, they, they don't understand that for them, relationship is going to change, okay? Their, their understanding is going to change. Think about it. Think about everything they've been told, all right? As they've walked this walk for three years, they've walked this walk. They've left families. You know, there's been all kinds of things that happened with them that they've seen. And this guy is larger than life. He's like Superman. You know, he's he's a he is he is it. And to and to for him to start talking like this, that I'm going to go. You don't understand to go to the Father is better than to stay here because the Father is greater than I am. It's, that's what he's been telling them in this discourse. And they're looking at it and saying, "Man, I don't get it. I don't know what he's talking about." They can't wrap their mind around the fact that this is actually going to happen because they really don't understand Isaiah 53. He, is, he has talked about this before, but they still don't. I don't think they want to believe it. But they're understanding. Think about what it's going to be like when they when they watch this unfold over the next few hours. They're going to watch it unfold. Peter's going to be there. He's going to cut off Malchus' zeal. Okay? Jesus is going to put it back on for him. And he said, man, he said, don't you know I can call Legion of Angels? I got this. I can get myself out of this. He begs to get out of it. John is there. Okay. Peter's there. He, he begs to. No, not going to get out of it. You know, and so as it starts to unfold, think about John, the guy that's writing this. He's going to stand at the cross and see his good friend. This is the one we think is talking about when he said the one that Jesus loved. He's going to be standing next to Jesus' mother. He's going to be the only one. Everybody else has scattered and run for the hill. And he's the only one. Think What, what do you think he's thinking? As he's, as he's seen him brutalized, not just killed, I mean butchered. That he's seen him butchered. How do you think John feels? How would you feel? I mean, we've lost people in our lives and, and, and felt bad. But to watch this unfold for this guy, and then it starts to, wait a minute. Now I remember something he said. And then and then the grief that you're going to involve, be, be involved with as you watch him be put in the, into a tomb and a huge stone rolled over and it's sealed with the, with the seal of Pilate. What do you think they're going to think? And then all of a sudden one day, just a couple of days later, the grief is still overwhelming. You've cried all day long. You've cried for two or three days. You're no different than anybody else. Your good friend has been butchered and brutalized and now he's gone. And you think, what have I wasted three years for? I wasted three years. And then all of a sudden, you open your eyes and he's standing in the room with you. Gives me chills to think about it. He's standing in the room with you. Thomas isn't there. Thomas said, I ain't leaving none of it. I ain't, nope, uh-uh, not gonna believe it. And as soon as he stands in the room with Thomas, through a locked door, Thomas falls down on his face and says, my Lord and my God, sit here. Put your hands there. Because that's what he said. Unless I can put my fingers in the hole, put my hand inside, I'm not gonna believe it. And as soon as, how much do you think that changed them? That now what they've been told was the truth. Do you think it, it changed anything? That's what he's going to tell them is going to happen here. Listen to what he said. He said, he says, uh, uh, verse 20, very, tr very truly, I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born in the world. So with you. Now is your time of grief, but I will see you again, and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. Now, stop it. You know, he alludes it to a woman in childbirth. You know, I never understood that. I've been told that before by my wife and by other women, how, how quickly that understanding of that pain goes away. It doesn't, it doesn't connect with me, okay? Because I'm not a female. I'm not a woman. I, I don't, I'm a male. I don't... I don't but that's what Jesus said. Jesus said, this is what it's going to be like. You're going to be sorrowful and, and full of grief and misery. And then, boom, all of a sudden, you're going to forget it all. And nobody will ever be able to take that joy away from you. Why? Why will nobody ever be able to take their joy away from them? Huh? Because they've seen it. Because they know it's true. They're also in another 40 days, 50 days. They're going to watch him. In the 40 days, they're going to watch him gone. Angels are going to be standing there talking to him, and they're going to, he's going to be gone. They're going, to, they're going to see all this, and it's going to change them. How is it going to change them? How, how, is it, how, is it, how is this connect to me? 
How does it connect to me? How do you think? You have to believe it for it to change. If you don't believe it, it's not going to change. I want to talk about it. We've talked about it before. I want to talk about it. All right. What gives you great joy? We've talked about this before. What gives, gives you great joy in your life? Family, kids, job, health, whatever. Gives you great joy. Okay. What kind of joy did Jesus give you? Does it make you forget the pain of the past? Does it make you forget? Can it Can it make you become? Let me tell you something. If you're walking in the light and you have been washed by the blood, this is mandatory that this has to happen in your life. If it doesn't, something's wrong with your walk. If you're not joyful about where you are and be able to pre present that joy to other people, something's wrong with what's going on with you. Because Jesus doesn't come to give you grief and misery. That's not what he comes to. He comes to give you life and give it to you abundantly. He comes to give you an understanding of knowledge of life that you can't get anywhere else. And I'm sorry, if you're mad all the time, if you're bent out of shape all the time, something's wrong. Something's wrong with the way you're looking at life, the way you're looking at Christ. You can't go over here this morning and not be filled with joy over the opportunity that we have. You know, I mean, we get we get to worship the the God of heaven and earth. Isn't that something? You know, and he said, he said, your joy is going to be turned to grief. I mean, your your grief is going to be turned to joy. And man, I'm looking, I'm saying, I'm trying to put myself in, in Paul's, I mean, in, in look at Paul. You know, I know he's not writing this. Look at Paul. When he's on the road to Damascus, what does he do? He's full of hate and anger and rape and depression and all that stuff. You know, we talked about last week. I talked about in our sermon. Disillusioned, discouraged, depressed. You know, he may not come across that way, but when he's going there with warrants in his pocket, he's angry. He's full of rage that these people are doing and I'm going to fix them. I'm going to change it single-handed. And Jesus shows up on the road to Damascus and instantaneously he shakes. Just like that. It's changed. Should that not be happening to us? Should it not happen to their son? Should that not be what's going on? If the Holy Spirit lives in me, should it not be on the process of changing me from the inside out, making me into something that I never could have dreamed of being before? So I have to hold on to that stuff from the past. These guys can't hold on to what they had before. Could they? Should they be angry at Rome? Would you be angry at Rome? Would you be angry at Judas? Would you be angry at the people that spit on him and cursed him and beat him and hit him? Would you be angry? I would. But they can't hold on to that. Because God won't allow us to hold on to that. You know, we have to be forgiving and loving, and that's hard. No, I'm not saying we're all, we, we all got it. I'm just saying that's where we should be heading to. And if that's not where you're heading to, you need to reevaluate. You need to reevaluate. Okay? Look at what he says next. Look at, let's go on. In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. Very truly, I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you have not had to ask for anything in my name. Ask, and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. Why did I not ask in his name? Because he was there. He was there. He said, I'm going to go to the Father, and he said, and I'm going, and I'm, I'm going, to, I'm going to take you to some scriptures, okay, about Jesus and his interaction. Well, let me finish reading this, and I'm going to take you to some things in Hebrew. All right, look at what he says. He said, uh, uh, verse 25, though I have been speaking figuratively, a time is coming when I will no longer use this kind of language, but will tell you plenty about my Father. In that day you will ask in my name. <laughs> I'm not saying that I will ask the Father on your behalf. No, the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and entered the world. Now I'm leaving the world and going back to the Father. Okay, what's he trying to tell him? He said, your relationship's going to change. What you're going to ask for is going to change. What you're going to see is, is important is going to change. Everything about you is going to change. He said, you will be able to go straight to the Father. And what will you know? What will you know? What was the Holy Spirit going to guide him? What truth he's going to guide him into? I'm going to show you. Look at some things in the book of Hebrews. All right? Look at, look at Hebrews chapter 7. No, chapter 4. Let's go to chapter 4 first. Hebrews chapter 4. This is, this is some of those things that, that the Holy Spirit... Is going to uh, is going to guide them into okay Hebrews chapter four. We're going to look at two places here. Uh, Hebrews chapter four. Uh, look at verse fourteen. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. 
For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet without sin. So what do we know is this, who this high priest is? He's gone to the Father. He's ascended to the right hand of the Father, right? And we know that he can empathize with us because he's been with us for three years. We know that. The Holy Spirit's guiding him to this. Now look at chapter 7. Look at chapter 7. Look at verse 23. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 23. Now there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. He's talking about the, high, the priesthood, the high priest. He said there was been many of them, but death prevented them from continuing in office. They couldn't because they were, they were human. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to what? What does it say? To intercede for them. What does he live to do? What does he say? He said, I'm going to go to the right hand of the Father. You're going to ask him now. You'll ask him in my name, and well, what I'll be interceding for you. I will be interceding for the things that I know you're going through. Man, that gives me a great deal of comfort. Because I know that it tells me that the other one told me that I have a high priest that has been tempted in every way, just like I am. Just without sin. He got angry. He got hurt. He got he got uh, he got frustrated. You know, I want to believe that he got depressed. He got disillusioned, discouraged, all of those things, and yet was not tempted to sin. Did not sin. That that makes me that gives me a great deal of comfort because I know now that I have a high priest that knows exactly what I'm going through, and the Holy Spirit is guiding me to this. Is guiding me into this and helping me to understand the things that I need to understand so that I can be the very best I can be. I'm not where I need to be. Neither are you. But if our life is not on the track going towards Him, if that's not where we are, then we're in trouble. We're in trouble. And the whole, and that means we're not allowing the Holy Spirit to work and to move us in the place where we need to be. That means we've got to start working on the things that, that we struggle with in our life. I'm not going to ask you what those are. I know what they are. We have to ask, we have to, how am I going to work on these things that I'm struggling with? How am I going to allow the Spirit and allow God to take these things that are, that are hindering me from being everything He wants me to be? I mean, you have children. Do you envision great things for them? Do you envision great things? You've got three kids. Do you envision great things for them? Do, I mean, do you have a plan to, to try to help them to get there? Jody, you've got kids. You have a vision for them. You you have a plan. You, I'm going to try to get them here through this, do this, or whatever. You know, how's that working for you? Days are bad. <laughs> well, let, let me let me tell you. I can. You know, I I've, I've looked at at, a, at Jessica's curriculum for her thing. She's going to do a parenting class. You know what I was amazed at? How do these people not know this? How do they not know this stuff? This stuff is elementary. How do they not know? That they're supposed to be a good mother, supposed to be a good mother. How did, did you have to teach them? And I'm, you know what I'm, I'm, I figured out? There are people out there that don't know. They really don't know. That's why the world is such a mess. I'm looking around here and I'm saying, i got families in here that they know. That, but you also know that we're flawed. And I've got some work to do in my own life so that I can help them get to where they need to be because they're looking at me as, as a mentor. Especially, like I've told you before, little boys look to the, the closest ra- male model, role model. All right? Your two sons are looking to you. Your daughter's looking to you. To be a role model, what do you have, Jody? What kind? Two girls and a boy. Two girls. So your girls are looking to you to be that role model. And if, and you know, if they don't have a mother, or, or you know, like like uh, uh, you know, in our situation, when they come with it, they're looking at Georgia to be that. The, the, if there was a daughter, when when we had that, that was, you know. But you know, now they're looking to Kevin, or they're looking to me to be the role model. So how, how am I going to fashion my life as I'm going past 9, 13, 14, and going on into adulthood? And if I don't do the right thing, what happens? What happens? They're going to find a role model somewhere else. That's what happens. They're going to find a role model somewhere else. You know? And that's why, you know, that's why we have to be a village where we help, where you're confident that when she sees them, you know, that, she's going to, that she's not going to do harm. She's going to do what's good for them. In any given situation, or you know, if, or take you know, or, or if it's in your, you know, she's going to try to help, whatever she can do. You know, that's what what Jesus said. He said, "I'm here to intercede because the Father loves you because you're His children." 
How does he? How does he? Do you think he feels about you? Don't I, no, don't look. Don't tell me what you see in the mirror. How did? How do you think he he feels about you? He loves me. Jesus, who was a who was a part of the Father, died for me. He gave his life on a cross. Died for me. I mean, if that doesn't get your attention, you know, I don't know what else I can say. You know, and then he says here, he says, uh, verse 27, Know the Father himself loves you because you love have loved me and have believed that I came. What, what's the criteria? If I love Jesus and believe in him, if I put my faith in him, that I trust him as my Savior, that he is the one that can save me from my sin, and I, I'm obedient because what did he just tell us in chapter 14 and chapter 15? He said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. You are my friends if you do what I tell you to do. So if I if I believe in him and I do that, then what do I know the Father's going to do? The Father's going to love me. Well, he has no choice. He, they, he's, he had, that's, what he's, that's what all this has been about. From Genesis back here, way back here, to this way back here, it's always been about one thing. Bringing Jesus to save souls, to save us, to save the people, save his children, to save his church, to save the kingdom. The place where Jesus ranked. Okay? You know, and he said, he said, he's telling them their future is changed. From this when he talks to me, your future has changed. Well, guess what? When Jesus comes in your life, guess what's supposed to happen? Your relationship with God changes. You know, your your uh, your understanding of life and how life is supposed to be lived changes, and your future has changed. What do I have to look forward to? I'm going home. I'm going home. I'm going home. That's what I have to look forward to. If I stay faithful to him, then I'm going to go home. That's what the, that's what he's telling them here. So your future is going to change. Now, look at what he says. Then Jesus' disciples said, Now you're speaking clearly and without figures of speech. Now we can see that you know all things and that you do not even need to have anyone ask you questions. This makes us believe that you came from God. Just wait a couple hours. You think this did it? Wait a couple hours and see what that's going to do for you. Because they're all, gee, what is what is he already told Peter going to do? Denied. You're going to deny me three times. Now here they're saying, oh man, now we believe you really did come from God. Really? <coughs> You're kidding, right? Doesn't look like it to me. Not from what they're going to do next. Now look, wait, then look at. Do you now believe? Jesus replied. That that sounds a little sarcastic to me. I don't know if Jesus had sarcasm. I don't know if he used that. But it sounds a little bit. You know, a time is coming, and in fact has come, when you will be scattered each to your own home. You'll leave me all alone. Oh, yeah, it was, I think, a little sarcastic. Really? Y'all got to really. He said, a time is coming, and in fact has now come, when you will be scattered each to your own home. You will leave me all alone. Yet I am not alone, for my Father, for my father is with me. I have told you these things so that in me you will have peace. In this world you will have, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. We got a couple of minutes, and I, you know, I'll probably pick this up next week about the peace angle. How has this, how does, how does this relationship with Christ going to give them peace when everything that's going to happen to they're, you know, when they, when Jesus finds them, you know where they're going to be, hiding, hiding, okay, scared to death, scared to death that the same thing going to happen to them that happened to their, to their mentor. All right. You know, even when they're in the upper room, he tells them to go, and they're standing in the upper room waiting, you know, waiting for somebody to knock on the door and come drag them out. That's what they're waiting for, okay? They, they're, they're, they're okay with it now by then, but then when the, when, when, the, when the Holy Spirit comes on them, everything changes, okay? Everything changes. And I'm just looking at this, I'm saying, what is it that happened that brought you peace, and what did you need peace from? I want you to think about that over this week, because that's what I'm going to ask you next week. What did you need peace from? And what is it what did it give you that comfort and that sense of relief from in your in your life that Jesus brought to you? And what do you think it brought to him? All right? We'll see you next week, guys. Thanks.